control of this. And so what ends up happening is that a lot of survivors face victim blaming. I hope that none of these survivors do, but I will tell you right now, the struggle is literally to keep these rape survivors alive. The suicidal ideation and what happens for the next couple of years, it will take all of the family's resources to focus on that survivor. It will take community resources to focus on her. And what happens, and I, I want to just tie this back into so much of what's been said on the panel, if I, if I may, um, what happens is that all of these symptoms of trauma are exacerbated when you face something that Jennifer Fry has called institutional betrayal. Meaning that the institutions that are supposed to support you and protect you, whether it's uh, your political institutions or a college campus, uh, when you come forward to support, to, to report rape or sexual violence or law enforcement, and I should just say, we live, we live in a culture that normalizes this, 90%, uh, the UN does a survey every year, 90% uh, of people across the globe view women as less than men, subhuman, it is patriarchy, it is misogyny, right? And it means, the hatred of women means that we all, in a, a percentage is actually 91%, it means we all hold that, right? Like, it's men and women alike who are holding up this idea that women are subhuman, which is driving this, right? What happened on October 7th was intersectional. It was the hatred of women, and it was the hatred of Jews. There's no way you could do that to a human body unless you first dehumanize that human body, and so that is what was happening there. And all of these symptoms are amplified when a survivor faces institutional betrayal, meaning the institutions that are supposed to support her do not. And what happened on that day is that the international feminist community and the local, the, the U.S. feminist community absolutely failed survivors with their silence. And they failed survivors because we have a something that has happened on what I call the illiberal left, which is the oppression Olympics, where the pain and suffering of certain identities matters more than the pain and suffering of, and of others. And I can say this as a college professor. I care deeply about the pain and suffering of people of color. I also care deeply, as hopefully every decent human being in this audience cares about the pain and suffering of women and queer folks and people who face fat phobia and, and people who face um, you know, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. We can hold these, these complexities, right? But what has unfortunately happened is, and we all know this, we don't say this out loud, uh, we all know this, um, that it, because we have defined this in racial terms in the, in the hierarchy of what matters in the U.S. left and even in the global left, um, we, have, we are not talking about this because we have ranked certain pain and suffering uh, higher. And I would say it is intellectually dishonest to, uh, and I, let's just go through a quick list, it's intellectually dishonest to act like this started on October 7th when it's, uh, there's a 2,000 year history of, of Jewish, Jewish perse persecution. It is dis intellectually dishonest to classify Jewish people as settler colonials or as white. Um, it, it is simply to take a relatively recent phenomenon of the racial hierarchies in the United States that emerged about 400 years ago and to take that and to put it on what is happening right now to understand what is happening in the movie. It is simply intellectually dishonest. It is intellectually dishonest to say that you care about the pain and suffering of people and not speak up about what happened on October 7th. It's also intellectually dishonest to not be as equally heartbroken for the, the children who are dying in Gaza so when you have, when Hamas, and not being able to separate the people, right, uh, from Hamas, the terrorist organization, it is intellectually dishonest to not have your heart break for those children just the way my heart breaks for the women of October 7th. And I hope that we can all embrace some intellectual honesty. Uh, yes, thank you. I think empathy is so important. And again, it's the antidote to intolerance. So, so right. You know, one of the things that we've witnessed and is obviously anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, but this attitude of treating women as subhuman. My question to you, with all this violence, on the treatment of women as weapons of war, the anti-Semitism and the Islamic phobia, what do you think, how do you think, this impacts democracy and the world. Thank you, Daphna. I uh, sat there as I watched the movie with mixed feelings. I was in deep grief. I 
deep uh, anger and uh, in deep uh, disappointment. Uh, why? Because for, for 75 years, the lobby of Hamas and the extremists have taken us all for a ride and we didn't speak up long and hard and strong. Uh, and today, uh, the silence of the Muslim communities, not around the U.S., let's talk about Los Angeles, is deafening, isn't it? Yes. yes. So I was embarrassed. But I remember the words of my father who would always tell me that we, as a human race, we are either coming from a problem or we are in a problem or we are going towards a problem. So, so let us take heart, and it's so, it's so exciting really for me to see every one of us, every one of you here, because those of us who have community, we cannot be victims. And to remember that we have work to do. In that, the question I want all of us to ask is, are we going to go through this or are we going to grow through this? And today, uh, October 7th has been a defining moment where every one of us, every one of us, no exceptions, we have to all take a leadership role. We can all do something and we have to do something. Because as Daphna asked me, anti-Semitism is on the rise. Uh, last week I was speaking at an panel on Jewish-Muslim uh, relationship at the Notre Dame Law School Religious Liberty Initiative. Everybody was talking about religious freedom and liberties internationally. Not one person spoke about the desecration of religious liberties for the Jewish community in the United States of America. And when I did raise that point, so many people came up to me and they thanked me. But, thank you. What that should tell us is, it is our silence that's not going to save us. If you have been following the news, 200 tombstones desecrated in Cincinnati. It is a violation of the Jewish people's religious freedoms and liberties. Um, when, the, when, the, when the temple in Los Angeles was desecrated, it was a violation of your right to assemble peacefully. But it's a constitutionally guaranteed right that was violated. There was no Muslim voices. And when Paul Kessler, who lives 30 minutes from where I live in, in Los Angeles, was murdered for carrying a Jewish flag, not enough Muslims, not one spoke up against that atrocity. And then we realized, Anila and I, we worked together hand in hand, so deeply, so committedly. We realized we are the leaders we've been waiting for. Thank you so much for that. So, 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 um, so remember, we have all come together. Just understand what we want to address. Take heart, because our silence is not going to save us. Thank you. And also, amnesia is unacceptable. Amnesia is our worst enemy. Um, you know, yes, Ahmad, I was going to get to you because for two reasons. One, you can continue what Soraya was saying, but the second one, we spoke, when you and I spoke, about the plight of women under Hamas in Gaza. Could you please elaborate on how much women were actually suffering in Gaza under Hamas before October 7th? Certainly, and I just wanted to pick up on a point you mentioned about the silence. Is one of the things that genuinely and sincerely sustains me despite the continuous challenges and the hatred and the attacks and the attempts to marginalize me or delegitimize me or paint me as a Zionist sellout or a CIA asset or a Mossad agent or this, this, that. Every day it's a different charge. There's, there are hundreds, and I mean literally hundreds on a monthly basis of Arabs, Muslims, Palestinians that I hear from on social media, in person, etc., who tell me, thank God you're saying what you're saying. We believe it, we want to say it, but unfortunately we can't. Um, I have a family, I'm part of a sprawling Muslim community in the United States, or I'm, you know, I, my family are still in Gaza, etc., etc. So I, I, I take inspiration from the fact 
that there are many who are silently in agreement. Now, the goal is to try to bring some of them out of the shadows. The goal is to say, okay, I can maybe understand if you're in the West Bank or if you're in Gaza or if you're in some other place that, you know, is difficult. You're dealing with the daily realities of life under those circumstances. You have Hamas, you have communal pressures. But if you're in the United States and you're bullied into silence in this unhelpful way, there's a threshold beyond which I start to lose my empathy. Or I don't want to use the word empathy, I'm all about empathy. I start to lose my patience, I should say, for you to not actually speak out, to not leverage your presence, your Western privilege. That is Western privilege, that we have a role and a duty to use, which is the privilege of freedom of speech, the privilege of having safety, the privilege of having our basic necessities met. So I absolutely work with this theme of silence and, and what it means and where it's coming from.